star is Brian. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the one and only, our friend, Governor Terry McAuliffe. Good crowd. Yes, indeed. Evening, everybody. How many live in Virginia? Some smart people here. <laughs> Low taxes, business friendly. Uh, well, Ter well, Governor, thank you for coming out. You bet. Uh, you know, you actually look pretty good. Uh, for, I mean, you seven about six months ago. You were in Africa, was in Africa, and you broke seven ribs? Yeah. Four, four are healed, I'm happy to report. I have three are still broken. Okay. I had a punctured lung, but you know what? I never let it bother. In fact, I didn't even tell anybody about it. For two weeks, I was on safari with the family. I was on a stallion. I never should have been on it. This okay. thing could have outrun a lion. It was so fast. I Way out of my league. I thought you maybe forgot to lock the car when you were through a drive through <laughs> safari, but that didn't happen. No, no, okay. it was the real Just deal. making sure. Okay, okay. Deal. Well, so we always like to start all our fireside chat on a personal note. So we, we, let's go way, 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 way back. Where were you born? Where were you raised? What did your parents do? And was sort of your first entrepreneur experience as a child? Let's start with you. Uh, born in Syracuse, New York. Yeah. Very good. Go, go Cues. <laughs> um, uh, mother, housewife, three brothers, four boys total in the family. My father was a commercial real estate agent up in Syracuse. Uh, was an entrepreneur from day one. Many of you probably heard the story. I actually started my first business when I was 14 years old. Started a driveway ceiling business. Uh, had to do it or else we couldn't afford to go to college and got to work very early on. By 15, uh, I decided to go big. Did parking lots, went out and got a truck. Was driving around the city of Syracuse with a truck with no license plate. I had no driver's license, but I was an entrepreneur. Um, from there, you know, I've been in probably many, many startups and became our nation's youngest bank chairman at the age of 30. I've done a lot of entrepreneurial things, ups and downs. I've seen it like everybody else in this room. You know, I really like that story where you had, I mean, you had said this many times in your past speeches, but you said, you know, it was out of necessity that you went into business because your parents couldn't afford to put you through college. I mean, that's the that's American dream. That's really amazing. Yeah, though. and I love to work. I mean, listen, you always got to work hard. I love taking risks. I'll be honest with you, I'm now 58. I have never worked for anyone in my life. I wouldn't be good at that, to be honest with you. Um, I'd rather sink, you know, rise or fall myself. I'd rather take huge risks. And if it works, great. A lot of things have worked. A lot haven't. That's part of, you know, I, I gave four commencements this year, UVA and VCU and ODU. Uh, commencement addresses that I gave, Northern Virginia Community College, I always tell everybody, think big, take risks, and don't be afraid to fail. And that ought to be the motto that you live by every single day. Take huge risks, you're going to fail, so what? What do you do the next day? You may not have known this, I actually ran for governor in 2009. We're going to talk about that, by okay. the way. Okay, we're going to cover that. Really? Uh, well, let's first talk about your first uh, uh, foray, foray into the polit in politics, right? Where you were uh, under raising funds for the Carter administration. Could you talk about your f this? It's it's a very famous story, by the way, where uh, you wrestled an eight foot, two hundred sixty pound alligator for fifteen thousand dollars. That's a contribution to a campaign. You so wouldn't have done that, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, listen, I was going to law school. I'd been at Georgetown Law School for like a week or two. Lived in a big group house, uh, you know, 14 guys, keg in the tub, the whole deal. And I had a buddy that was working at the Carter White House for the re-election, came home one day and said, you want to go work on the re-election? We're looking for people to help raise money. I'd never done that for a political campaign. Ah! I said, I can always go to law school. I'd had a scholarship, and I said, you know what the heck, I can always go. Left law school. Ended up going to work on the Carter campaign. Ended up going to like 45 states. And at the age of 23, became the national finance director of the whole campaign. Part of the process where I got a little notoriety, I'd raised a lot of money. I don't know if anyone's here from Florida and Broward County, the Seminole Indian tribe. This was long before you had casinos and all the stuff you have now. Back then on the reservation, they'd sell cigarettes and have bingo. No taxes. And they, they were a pretty wealthy tribe, the Seminole Indian tribe. And I'd you know, probably raised like 100 grand from them during the campaign. I went back for one more contribution. I said, I need 15 grand more. Chief Billy says, no, Terry, we've given you too much, da, da, da. I said, oh, you know, 
with fundraising, folks, as you all know, you got to keep asking. What's the worst thing they can say to you? No. I wouldn't have had a date in high school if I took no for an answer. So that was just the beginning. So I went back. He said, all right. He was tired of me harassing me. He said, all right. I'll let you take part in an ancient tribal custom. We'll do so. I said, oh, I think I'd smoke a peace pipe or something easy. He said, we want you to wrestle an alligator. I said, what? I said, I'm from Syracuse, New York. The worst thing I've ever seen is a squirrel. I said, oh, yeah, I'm not wrestling it. Oh, no. It'll be drugged. It'll be toothless. I thought, you know, that doesn't sound so bad. Well, one thing got to another, so we scheduled the big date. They actually did it every, like, third Saturday. They sold admission and da-da-da-da. And what they would actually, the Native Americans would wrestle alligators. This, I, would, I was the first uh, white guy to ever do this. But we were on the inside deal. Well, anyways, my big mouth got me in trouble. Everybody heard about it. So people started calling. President Carter called me. And I didn't even know Carter. I mean, I worked for him, but I mean, I was just a young kid and worried to death. And you can't do that. Oh, don't worry, Mr. President. I'm going to do this for you. And uh, I remember Vice President Mondale called. Could care less about my health. Good luck. <laughs> Get the check. So anyways, the big day comes, really got out of hand. Time, Newsweek, networks, everybody's there. Chief Billy freaks because he said they charge admission. So he said, we can't go out and do this like drug. We'll get in trouble if they find out we did this with you. I'm saying, well, what are you saying? He said, we either do it the real way or we just got to call it off. But now everybody in the world knows I'm doing this thing. And so what do you do? So I said, tell me what we do. So anyways, we spent an hour practicing. And if you haven't done it before, actually with a big alligator, you actually get on its back and you put your knees right, befi right behind their two front legs so that they can't back up on you. And then they bring the snout up and you hold it. An alligator has very weak muscles to open. They close with a tremendous amount of pressure. But you've got to stay steady on it. The tail can snap your vertebrae in half. So they're going to try and wag the tail and try and knock you off and then bite you is what they try to do. Generally, an alligator will not attack a human unless you're in what you call the zone of danger, sitting on his back, you're in the zone of danger. <laughs> so anyways, time comes, we practice, and they'd all been drinking, what do you call that stuff? Mad Dog 2020, I don't know if he's over there, right? They still have that? Half of them are in the tank, and they're saying, well, if he gets loose, we'll shoot him. I said, you're not gonna shoot anybody. You guys are gonna end up shooting me, so. We go out, huge pit, lots of people, and uh, they bring him out, his, his name was Jumper. He comes out in a big pickup truck, and you're in a big dust, you know, big dirt, Thing and they got stands all around you, and they bring him out. And they bring him out. He's got a big sur burlap sack over his head, big thing, and they put him on the ground. You're 265, 270 pounds, and you get on its back. He's still got the bur burlap sack on over its head, and then they pull the sack off, and he's got a rope around his mouth, and then you get settled on it, and they bring it up, and then you say ready, and then they take the rope off, and you're that you have to stay on there for three minutes the whole time. He is like whipping his tail. It's a huge, you know, very powerful tail to try and knock you off. And uh, I stayed on it for the three minutes. And then what happens is Chief Billy comes up and grabs it by the neck and holds it up. So it's two front legs. And then you scoot off the back. <laughs> Chief Billy did it a couple years later. He lost his thumb. He actually wears his thumb around his neck that he had like put in for mail in plastic. But I got everything. I, I Good did luck it. Charm. I'll do anything once. Won't do it again. So I got the fifteen awesome. thousand dollars. Awesome. All right, oh. we're, we're done. <laughs> and yeah. I got my picture. I'm 22 years old. Yeah, that's amazing. I got my picture in Newsweek, first time. Yeah, it was worth it for that. Well, the question is, would you would you do it again? No. Okay. Once. once, once All right. Once. I'll Great. Do anything once. Almost okay. anything. Well, that was amazing. Yeah. Uh, that. By the way, that's the uh, that's the the that's the summary. Uh, story, summarized story. If you want the real unabridged version, you just it's in what what a party book, right? First That's of all, I would assume book. you all have purchased my New York Times best-selling book called "What a Party: My Life in Politics and Business." It actually got to be um, number tied for five on the New York Times bestseller list, number one on the Washington Post, number one on the Wall Street Journal. It did very well. It actually went to paperback, and if you're really fired up, you can download it. It's audio, 20 hours. <laughs> of my voice <laughs> and Hillary Clinton actually reads the foreword so tonight you download that baby you before get you yourself, go to sleep before you go to sleep you get yourself a little red wine and a candle and you fire that thing up you're on your own I just leave it at that it could be okay. like something special all right um, I'm sure well, you've done it Brian <laughs> yeah. wow Wow is right. 1776, the comedy club. This is great. 
So, um, you know, let's let's get into a little bit more serious topics here. Uh, so, you know, this room is full of entrepreneurs, and you know, you one of the most valuable skills as an entrepreneur is to raise money. And uh, Al Gore has said that, quote unquote, you're the greatest fundraiser in the history of the universe. And 2000, between 2001 and 2005, you were the chairman of the DNC, and you raised almost half a billion dollars. So the thing is, is that at the end of the day, whether it's for a campaign or for a startup, what is your advice for folks who are raising capital for you yeah. know, investing in a, in a vision or a future? And listen, at the end of the day, what separates most people, it separates a lot of candidates because they just don't want to ask for money. You've got to be willing to pick up that phone or go to that meeting and ask. And be honest with you, that separates out most people because they just don't want to go ask someone for money. Once you get over that hurdle, at the end of the day, you know, I've been successful at it. I've always tried to make it fun. I mean, you got to enjoy what you're doing in life. And people, I always say, want to be with winners, not whiners. So, I mean... You got it in the political world. You got to convince them your candidate's going to win, but they want to see passion. They, you know, listen. I have invested in so many investments. <laughs> Majority of them have lost money. Uh, you hope you make enough in the other ones that compensate for the ones you lose. But I've given money for people because I've loved their passion. They believed in something, and you know what? There are a lot of folks like me that will invest in projects and people. I invest in people, and if someone, if you go out with someone, you have a passion, you have a good idea. People will follow you, but you got to be energetic about it. You got to have fun about it. You got to have a serious plan about it. And listen, you all want to make money with your investments, but more importantly, a lot of folks want to invest in people who have passion. And I have always had passion. Uh, all this I've done in politics, I've never taken a paycheck. I've done this all volunteer work. I mean, I've spent over half my life as a full time volunteer for the Democratic Party. I believe in its principles. I, I believe in the candidates. So, I mean, I don't get paid to do this. I do this because I love it and I believe in it. And when you do something you love and you believe, Brian, people will follow you and they'll give you money to do it. I'm asking for a non-deductible, non-returnable, non-investable check. You write a big check to a candidate or a party, you know, you don't get to deduct or anything. It's gone. It's, these are after-tax dollars, so they're the hardest dollars to ask for. But you know, through the years, I guess I've raised over a billion dollars through all the candidates and all that. And as I say, I've done it because I believe in it. So, you know, you have a very impressive background. You are a former banker, a real estate developer, home develop a builder, hotel owner, internet venture capitalist. So, which job do you think you enjoyed the most? Oh, Besides wow. being governor, obviously. Yeah, by far, I put the. I, I always have loved politics. Being governor is the greatest job I've ever had because at the end of the day, folks, you can actually help people. Um, yesterday was a huge day for me. Uh, I just announced I've restored the rights of 8,250 people, felons in Virginia, who I've just given them back their civil and voting rights, which is more than, <laughs> which is more than any governor in Virginia history has done in four years. I've done it in 17 months, and I got 31 months to go. At the end of the day, you want people feeling good about themselves. You want them back in the community. Um, and we've got to move away from this where we're pushing people out to the margins. As you probably all have seen in the paper today, I, I stepped out and I said, I want the Confederate flag off of every license plate in the Commonwealth of Virginia. <laughs> you got to be open, and, and I don't want to give political speech here, but my whole, and listen, we're doing great. For those who live in Virginia, you've seen the numbers. I just announced 4.9% unemployment, lowest in the entire Southeast of the United States of America. We've brought in $7.5 billion of capital since I've been governor. That has shattered any prior governor's record. 30,000 new jobs. I mean, we are rocking with our economy. I worry about sequestration. That is the one thing that keeps me up at night. But you cannot do that if you don't make your state open and welcoming. So when I ran for governor, and I see some folks here who helped me, you know, I said I got to protect women's rights. I told women I'd be a brick wall to protect your rights. We had some very bad, as you remember, four years ago in Virginia, some very anti-woman legislation. So we stopped that. They were going to shut down the women's health clinics. Not one women's health clinic has closed. I wanted to be open to members of the LGBT community. We'd had some bad history in Virginia. I'm proud to say that I'm the first statewide candidate in the South to come out for marriage equality. I'm the first Southern governor to actually perform a gay marriage. I've done an executive order to allow loving gay couples to adopt. I'm trying to get Virginia in line with 90% of Fortune 500 companies. So that job, you can help people every single day, and that's why I love it. Of all the other ones, Brian, there isn't one that sticks out. 
I've been in 30 different fields. What I've loved is trying new in different types of fields. No, not one will stick out. The one I loved the most was when I was 14 years old. And I'll never forget this day when I, I went out and had my business cards made at 14 years old. I still remember like it was yesterday. McAuliffe Driveway Maintenance. Terrence R. McAuliffe, President, CEO. Uh, it was me. 478-2508, my phone number, call anytime. I used showing. to have my mother answer the phone. McAuliffe Driveway Maintenance, I mean, like I was some big corporation. You were showing that to your, your friends, obviously, right? I'm the CEO. Yeah. Um, you know, this, this, uh, you know, you said you were in 30 different industries. Uh, I heard that your Rolodex, it's not probably, it's not a Rolodex, it's probably like your iPhone address book now. Okay, your Rolodex. But it has, I heard it has 18,000 names in it. And I estimated you probably, uh, from the age of 18 till your age right now, which I'm not going to say, but um, you 58. had 58, okay. okay. Sure. Uh, but I don't look it. You're all supposed to yell. Right. You don't look it, right. <laughs> but you had to meet every day 1.2 persons, like, in yeah. meet and greet. Yeah. That's crazy. That's, I mean, how do you, how do you um, keep yourself relevant and keep your Rolodex, your address book, you know, relevant to the people That's a good question, too, because I do have, and it's probably a lot more than that by now, but a, a, number, a name and a number on a Rolodex doesn't really mean anything. What I have tried to do, Brian, through the years is stay in contact with people. You know, I make dozens of birthday calls still every single day, even as governor. When I was a young man working for Carter, a fundraiser, you know, I'm 22, 23 years old. I used to wear fake glasses to make me look older because I'd go ask someone for $100,000 for the President of the United States and, you know, I looked like I'd just gotten out of high school. So I used to actually wear clear glasses. If any of you go to the Palm restaurant uh, up here on uh, 19th and I'm, I've got three pictures in there, but I do have my one from 1980 with these big old, they're clear, there's, no, there's nothing to them. But I used to, <laughs> The key back then was getting to the chairman of a company, like the chairman of Boeing. I'm 22 years old. They would send me into a city and then say, okay, Rosalind Carter will be here in three weeks, raise 300 grand. Give me a list and that's it. So I developed relationships with all of the personal assistants. Back then we actually referred to them as secretaries. And on Valentine's Day, I used to buy thousands of those little Valentine cards, you know, like, I'm nutty about you with a little squirrel on it. Remember those things you get in the I day? love you. That, that's one. I would mail thousands of them out every Valentine's Day to every secretary in the country of, of, of a CEO that I met. And I can tell you this. Then the list got so big, and then everybody got mad at me because they didn't get them. <laughs> I had to stop it, ultimately. But for a couple of years, I tell you, my call got put through like hot knife through butter. It's wow. amazing. Hashtag start grind at Governor VA. Do you have a Twitter? At Terry you got McCullough. it all. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I assume you're on it. Oh no, I, I mean, I mean you. Do you, do you have a handle? Yeah. You have Terry McAuliffe yeah, at Terry because because I, I have at Governor VA. Please yeah, please tweet out. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Okay, great. Do you have a Twitter account? Okay, so <laughs> entrepreneurship. I want to talk about some of the initiatives that you're working on. I mean, you started you started talk you started to, uh, you know started talking about this, but how do you what what sort of the initiatives are you working on to? create a better ecosystem, startup ecosystem for us in Virginia? I'll make yeah. it very open. No, a great question. And this is what I'm trying. We have very, as I say, very low unemployment, very low taxes. For all of you who are, you know, in the tech space starting business, we have, we're the only state around. I think, I'm not sure any other state in the country. We have a total capital gains exclusion. Uh, you invest and you do a tech startup in the Commonwealth, you never pay any long-term capital gains. That is a great recruitment tool to bring business. We got a great angel investor tax credit. So our tax code is very good, very entrepreneurial to help folks. Northern Virginia, as I say, we have more tech workers than any other state in America per capita. People are surprised at that. They think of Silicon Valley. We have more data centers. We have the most data centers of any state in America. We have all the cabling, as you know, that what we call the dark cable, all the intelligence, defense assets. I mean, we have the Pentagon, we have the CIA, we have Quantico. We have the largest naval base in the world. All of these assets help us build an ecosystem for entrepreneurs. And we're working hard to continue to do that. Uh, I've just started a brand new cybersecurity commission in the Commonwealth. Uh, I tell my children every day, cyber, cyber, cyber. This is the one area that the federal government is going to spend billions on. I want Virginia to be the cyber capital. We're invested a tremendous amount of resources 
to build the cyber. I'm trying to build a bio business. I just hosted the, the governor's first bio conference. Three, 400 businesses from all over come to Virginia. I just uh, cut the ribbon. We just, uh, Inova Hospital, just took over the Exxon Mobil site, which I was very active in, 117 acre site. We will now be the world leader in human genome sequencing, personalized health, proteomics, all of the new, like when a child's born, now you're gonna be able to determine what the proclivity for some type of disease may be to be able to treat someone early on. We are building that. So what I talk about big data, cybersecurity, personalized medicine, all of the new genome sequencing, I want Virginia to be the base. So we're investing. We do a lot of investment to bring businesses in. We have a tax code, as I say, great angel investor tax credit, no capital gains. You do not pay any capital gains if you start a, te a tech business in the Commonwealth. Uh, and we have, you know, that's how we're trying to build it. I want to talk, talk more about the angel credit, the, the tax credit that you talked about. I mean, uh, it's 50% leverage of the first 50,000 right. individual puts so it. So that means that cash back. you get cash back. So 25,000? Yeah. You get cash back to come invest in Virginia. Okay. You guys hear that? Okay. Yeah, I'm sure they all know. Give me your hands again. How many in Virginia again? They're all smart, brilliant folks here. Right. Yeah. I'm from Virginia too. Yeah. Uh, but that, but it's, it, but Virginia is probably one of the friendliest states for angel investments, right? Yeah, we're always rated at the top of all the different. We've always, you know, been very pro business as it relates to business regulations. We have the friendliest, very low taxes, six percent corporate tax rate. We haven't changed it in, I think, 44 years. We're not going to change it. If I'm going to do anything, I'm going to take it down, not up. So people like stability in the tax code. Uh, as I say, the lowest unemployment of any state in the entire southeast United States. I mean, not many states can say they have under 5% uh, unemployment. We do, uh, and we're growing. One big reason, Brian, is we have great educational institutions. We've got George Mason here. We've got UVA. We've got Virginia Tech, which is putting out so many different technologists. William and Mary, I mean, I could go through all of them. And our K through 12, and this is how we've been able to recruit folks from Silicon Valley. Our K through 12 is always in the top three, four in the nation. So for budding entrepreneurs who want to start a family, they want to go to a state that has a great education system. Virginia's K through 12 system is always right in the top. UVA, you know, William and Mary, Virginia Tech, always rated in the top for public institutions in the top five. Can you talk a little bit about the Virginia Velocity Business Plan competition? Uh, it's, I yes. know it's only, it's only geared toward bioscience and energy sector. Do it you is. Have those two right now, and I, we've just put a million dollars into it. Okay. And those that bid on, we're going to give you direct prize money, grant money. It, it, 850000 Yeah. It's one of the largest, right, competitions? Yeah. Just announced it the other day. Okay. Um, I, w I actually wanted because the reason why I, uh, the reason why I'm mentioning about this is because I wanted, I wanted to see if you could open this up to other industries like cybersecurity or consumer web. I wanted to go back to the cybersecurity topic. Um, so there's a lot of initiatives here. You have Mach 37. Uh, in fact, actually, I, I heard Senator Warner, Warner talk about the key industries in the Northern Virginia area, and he had mentioned cybersecurity. Uh, Un UAV, unmanned, yep. you know, unmanned mm -hmm. driverless cars, and then he mentioned satellite. Uh, so on, for cybersecurity, what are we doing uh, to make this into a world-class hub where now you have companies in the valley like FireEye and say, whoa, 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 why are we here? We need to be back in D.C. Yeah. What are we doing? Well, as I say, we, I've just started the, the new cyber commission, got the best cyber companies in Northern Virginia to come to make my recommendations to me, which we've already, we're acting on for our educational institutions. I've asked Richard Clark, who was the advisor of the last three presidents, knows more about cyber, did all the counterterrorism, Richard Clark. He's actually a Virginia resident who actually now chairs the commission for us to make recommendations on what we need to do. We have a built-in advantage because Cyber is so related to defense, military. As I say, the Pentagon is in Virginia. Quantico, which already has a gigantic cyber presence at Quantico already with the FBI, which has a facility at Quantico. Uh, and we have all the cabling, we have all the data centers. So we are a natural place. Uh, the White House has announced that they want to build what you call a cyber campus to take some of their military defense assets 
combine them in one place. I want that cyber campus in the Commonwealth of Virginia. I've driven you know where? Huh? Where, where would you put well, it? It would be most likely Northern Virginia because, as I say, proximity to all those other assets because, as I say, it's very defense related. I mean, everybody knows what's going on. You've all just seen that allegedly the Chinese have been hacked into our system for over a year. They, uh, my, the head of my Secretary of Defense Affairs, our uh, Admiral, who just left his Fleet Forces Command, told me the other day his information had been hacked. We saw the big anthem, 80 million. Two of my five children had their information hacked. I mean, this is impacting everybody. So uh, it, will, you know, it will be in this region, but we are the natural place for it. Number one, because we have, as I say, the highest concentration of technology workers right in Northern Virginia. The Ballston, Clarendon, Arlington area, uh, and going out to Reston and, and Herndon, tremendous amount of technologists. At the end of the day, and as I say, I just got back from a six nation trip. We just last week, we were gone for about 12 days, brought a bunch of business back. Um, what people want to know, Brian, is, yeah, I'll put a facility in your state, but are you going to have a workforce for me? Yeah. Are you going to have the technology workers? We're going to have probably in the next 10 years in Virginia, a million Virginians will retire. We'll create probably about another half a million new jobs. A million and a half jobs I'm going to have to fill. Now, that's a big deal for us to figure out. And about 65% of those jobs are going to require less than a four-year degree. Two-year degree, credentialing, apprenticeship, licensure. Our economy is changing and how, and how we deliver a workforce. So I tell my education folks, Ann Holton is my secretary of education, I say to all my folks, don't talk to me about degrees anymore. I don't want to hear that. Because a degree with a lot of debt without a skill set is worthless to me. Talk to me about skill sets. Are we graduating folks with skill sets? And everybody has their own interest, and people are going to do what they're going to do. I had a daughter graduate last year, Dory. I love her dearly. Um, she got out. Um, you know, she studied liberal arts, and she's over uh, in Africa saving elephants today. But we need people to save elephants, of course. That was her choice. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of money for that elephant education. I, <laughs> I will tell you that. Uh, no, no, very important. And uh, she knows I have fun with her. And I had a son last week get out of the Naval Academy. He's now a second lieutenant in the uh, United States Marines. So I, I balanced those two off. So one, one was free, but not really free. He's got to give five years. But, you know, but we need skill sets. We need, I need folks understanding the STEM courses, IT. And that's what we have to drive that economy. That's that why, is the economy of the future. That's why Virginia Tech and all these. Uh, you bet are very, very important. Yeah. Um, can we talk a little bit about the unmanned system? An interesting, this just driverless cars uh, mandate that you have, but you created an executive order launching an unmanned system commission. Uh, what is it, and how can drone startups and driverless startups, yeah. driverless car startups can get involved? And uh, I am very passionate about this, but I can tell you Senator Warner, yeah. who I've had many conversations with, um, he thinks, you know, Mark got in very early in the cell phone business. He thinks this could even be bigger yeah. than what the cell phone was. I mean, he's really passionate. Uh, Virginia is one of six states in the entire United States designated now by the federal government as a site to develop the unmanned uh, aerial vehicles. Uh, so we have a site. It's actually down to Virginia Tech, and we've teamed that up. We have a launch pad, as you know, at Wallops Island where we are launching satellites into space. We want to use that facility at Wallops Island to become, on the East Coast, the, the site for all UAV testing, designing, engineering, working with Virginia Tech. And I agree with Mark. I do think this, this is going to be the biggest thing we have seen in a very long time. We have an advantage because we are, our region, we are, the, we, Virginia has been chosen as a site to develop, engineer, and test these new UAVs. Yeah, I mean, there was a report out that said that the UAV industry, uh, emerging industry, could bring in about 342 million, but three three thousand 3,500 jobs to Virginia by 2012, or Abs 2025, sorry. 25, yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk about, this is the very, this is really interesting for me, but this Virginia Automated Corridor, which is, uh, it offer automated vehicle developers, get this, to the opportunity to test their technology on Virginia roads, which includes 70 miles in 
it's interstate, it's 66, 495, and 95. So if I had a test, like, I don't know, if I had one, a Google, you know, driverless car, like, could I actually use that? You could. In, in 66 and, right now? And that's what we're trying to do, to set up systems for people to do the new driverless cars. Yeah. We're trying, Brian, if you can see, we are trying to get in front of all these new latest technologies. Because to be honest with you folks, th those that listen to the radio and watch TV, I talk about this every day. We are in a very unique position in Virginia. Virginia is the number one recipient of Department of Defense dollars. Think of that, of all 50 states. Largest naval base in the world. And I mean, we, all the aircraft carriers are built down in Norfolk, down in Newport News. That's great when they're spending money, but we are now in a period of defense cuts. We are in a period now of sequestration. I have no idea what's going to happen October 1st. So I, my mission and why I'm so passionate about this is I have to diversify the economy. I want to keep our assets, federal assets. I want to grow them. We just found out Fort Pickett will now be $420 million investment, the training of all security personnel. We just won that in Virginia over Georgia and some other states. But I understand also that the defense business as we've known it in the past is not going to exist. Bringing in new business. That's why on the new driverless cars, on the UAVs, on the cybersecurity, on the cancer personalized health, on the big data. data green tech too. All of it. Yeah. Green, huge on the green tech. We are the first state to get an offshore lease for a wind turbine, as you know. I just signed legislation to the Governor's Solar Development Fund. We just put that together. I got Dominion to put $700 million into it. Solar, renewable energy, this is gonna be another opportunity to make a lot of money in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, net metering, energy efficiencies, all of those huge opportunities. And we incentivize those businesses through our tax code. Actually, uh, Amazon just announced that they're building the largest solar farm on the Where? east of the Mississippi and Virginia. Thank you. Okay. Booyah! Yes. Boom! Okay. And uh, why do you think, Brian? <laughs> uh, hashtag I love Maryland and D.C. I really do, honestly. But uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get as many assets as I can in Virginia. Startup grind. At, uh, hashtag startup grind at uh, Governor VA. So I want to talk about this whole thing about... Uh, Virginia or the DMV area in Silicon Valley, uh, you know, we had five past guests in Startup Grind where uh, before they were even bought out, I mean, we had them as guests here and they would talk about how wonderful it is to set up a company here. You know, we had Smart Things um, that was, you know, one of the number two in Internet of Things. We had Foundation DB, it was an amazing database company here. We had Sumize. Smart Things got sold to Samsung for $200 million. Foundation DB got sold to Apple, probably $400 million. Semis to Twitter. And now Jay Verde is now the newly minted billionaire here in, in DC. I mean, people don't know that. I'm trying to actually get him. But so what are we doing to prevent Silicon Valley from sapping our area, right? And ver versus can we have them say, hey, look, t you know, DC is a serious place. Set a like a, a, a Virginia is a serious place. Okay, okay. Virginia, DMV is a serious place. Set up a like a headquarter, you know, like so f you know with FireEye and Mandiant that that, that sort of arrangement. Not Foundation to be. We got we bought you, and then we're going to sap you guys out to the valley. What are we doing to incentivize these big technology companies to stay here and create a local presence? Well, let's do, you raise a good point. Let's talk about Silicon Valley, and they've been obviously tremendously successful. As I talk to, and I talk to young entrepreneurs all the time, the, the problem that we have had historically here is access to capital. They have, they can walk down the street, bump into somebody, and they will fund their startup. Let, let's just be clear. It has been harder here in our region, Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. Access to capital. Everyone in this room needs money. Now, most people go to Silicon Valley because that's where the money is. I'm trying to reverse that. Now, we have an advantage because of our educational system, as I say, K through 12. I think that's one huge advantage. We have to do a better job of getting venture capitalists in the region and doing a better job of exposing venture capitalists to our startups. That's where Silicon Valley has us beat. We can say whatever we want. Nobody, I don't think anyone in this room would probably disagree with that statement. That has been my focus, recruiting. You, you, 
Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley. What I'm trying to do is re recruit venture capitalists, money sources to move to this region. You actually, uh, I wanted to go, so you are, that, I, I want to talk about you, you recruiting. So you, are, you are actually are recruiting folks to Virginia, your secretary, no of, your secretary of Technology, Karen Jackson and Richard Clark. So what sort of folks are you looking for to fill these, you know, I don't know, you have open recs at, um, in Virginia. We, we have a room full people. of, we have room full of entrepreneurs here. Yeah. What can you tell them? I mean, why should we work for, for you under Virginia? Well, first and foremost, listen, I, I want to be very clear, first of all, and I do love Maryland and Virginia. We are strong as a region. And this, I'm not saying, you know, do Virginia versus D.C. In fact, I've been very successful bringing businesses back globally. I mean, last year I brought back the biggest deal ever done by a Chinese company in America. We won that in Virginia. Two billion dollar investment, 2,000 new jobs. So I, I have a global perspective. So I do, you know, and listen, uh, I'm very close to Muriel Bowser and Larry Hogan, and I hope we can all say a prayer for Larry Hogan. Just devastating news the other day of cancer. But when I talk about this, in fairness, it's not Virginia versus my neighbors, because we are strong as a region. But, and I'm, and our assets in recruiting business, but why come to Virginia? First and foremost, we have the lowest taxes, one of the lowest tax state. I think we're the sixth lowest in the entire United States of America. Taxes are very low. Business-friendly uh, regulations. Very entrepreneurial government. We're there to assist you. We have a whole team, Maurice Jones, my Secretary of Commerce, Karen Jackson, Secretary of Technology. Great place to live. We're building communities. I'm really trying to fix transportation. We've just, I've just got the new cars, the 7,000 series cars for the new Silver Line. Just got approval to power up the Orange Line so that we can get the new eight Pass eight car trains on the metro system. But we have an ecosystem in Northern Virginia with all of the businesses. We have businesses, we have over 800 international companies. Most of those companies are in Northern Virginia. And they are here looking how to invest. Uh, so you're a man of your own words. You, you had the chance to start a business in New York or other places. Why did you decide to stay here? I mean, this is this is a question I always ask for you know DC Tech entrepreneurs. Why did they decide to start a company here versus other places? What what is about Virginia, the DMV area, that yeah. other places don't offer? Yeah, and, and why, why did you we start do, with I mean, listen, we Dorothy and I. Listen, I'd been success, successful at a young age in business. I pretty much could have moved wherever I wanted to. What I loved about Virginia, very pro family. Great, I go back to the education system because we all want our kids to have a quality education. I think, Brian, for me, that was so important. But, you know, they, they got 28 miles of, of oceanfront. They got the mountains. I love to go out to the Blue Ridge Mountains. I think it's one of the prettiest states in the country. I love the temperate climate. I grew up in Syracuse, New York. I love my hometown. Uh, but if you haven't experienced a winter in Syracuse, New York, you have not experienced life. Uh, I love it. But I wanted a temperate climate. I'd also done a lot of investing in businesses, shopping center, apartment complexes, and in housing. I used to own a big home building company, chairman of that, in Florida. So I've done it all over. But I think the best place, Dorothy and I felt the best place to raise a family, to get all the different experiences, was Virginia. And to be honest with you, thank you. I also love the idea, you know, I love be, and I love politics also, so there was a natural inclination to be close to the United States Capitol. This is where, if you want to be involved in politics, this is the epicenter. So it was a little bit of both uh, for me. So we got five minutes left here. We Unfortunately, we won't, we won't be able to that open Irma, up. she is mean. Yeah. Rattlesnake. Uh, so uh, we won't be able to open it up for Q&A. So but we always uh, close, we have closing questions. And uh, I always have, I always close with two questions. Um, one is, and I'll do the second one. So the one is, uh, if you can go back 30 years, what would be the best single piece of advice you would have given yourself? Yeah, and I say this a lot. Don't wrestle an alligator? No, yeah, well, <laughs> but I tell people this all the time, and I really try to tell young people, and I did it at the graduation speeches, don't, set, don't put out a set plan for your life. I've seen so many of my friends who said, I'm going to be here, 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 and here. And what will happen to you is an opportunity like happened to me. I left law school. I always wanted to be a lawyer. 
I took a risk. I took a chance. I always tell people, follow your passions. Do what you want to do. And when you're young, this is the only time you're going to really have an opportunity to do it. And you know, I remember campaigning. I always, I remember this so well. You know, when I was out campaigning, I'd do a lot of the metro stops. You'd be out there at six, seven o'clock in the morning shaking hands. Some would shake, some wouldn't. Some would yell at you. <laughs> some would wave at you with one finger. I mean, it is what it is. Um, <laughs> It's politics. I mean, you got to have a thick skin to be in this business. But I saw, Brian, so many people every day going into work with their head down, looking depressed, like they were now going to go spend eight hours doing something they didn't want to do. It always struck me. I would tell people, go do what you want to do in life. Follow your passions. you got to be willing to take huge risks and chances. And I'll just be honest with you. When you do this, you're going to fail at it. That's okay. It's what you do the next day you get back up. As I say, I ran in 2009 on a platform of big ideas, high-speed rail, renewable energy. I said, if you don't like my big ideas, don't vote for me. <laughs> and they didn't. <laughs> I got crushed in the primary. But you know what? I love the experience. I got out of bed the next day and got right back at it. And now I'm the 72nd governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. It would not have happened had I not done that first run in 2009. So the only advice is, it's your life, you only live once, go live it, go have fun doing it, take risks, take chances, but golly gee, don't be afraid to fail because it's gonna happen. And always be positive. I think of the one thing you will find with me, I love life, I love every day of my life, I really do. Every day you get out of bed has the potential to be a great day. It's what you wanna do with it. And I don't have any time for negative energy. I don't sit around and listen to gossip, but I don't care. I like positive energy. People, as I say, want to be with winners, and you stay positive. If you're positive, people want to be with you. People want to stay positive. Awesome. And one last question. Yes, sir. Probably the most important question. Uh, I always ask, who is your favorite superhero or historical figure and why? Yeah, I always have got to put Franklin Roosevelt at the top. You think when this man came in, he ended a war, but more importantly, he came in and our country had experienced uh, the Depression. There were so many people out of work, so many depressed people. He was successful because he gave people hope. More than anything else as president, he gave people hope, and he got our nation out of a depression, and he ended a world war. And, you know, to battle all those things. But if you go back and read the historical stories on our economy and p literally people, as we know, were jumping out of windows on the stock market crash. This man came in and gave people hope. And today, we are the strong country we are today. A lot of it is because what Franklin Roosevelt put in place back then. So I asked your press secretary beforehand. She told me the answer. Uh, and... We found a historic uh, picture of Fr Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, and this was this is him at the Nebraska convention with Governor Grizzold and uh, Glenn Martin, who's the co-founder of Mar Lockheed Martin. And so we found a quote here. It says, "It goes as uh, FDR is a <laughs> Governor Terry McAuliffe rocks," and then. The governor says, yeah, boss. And he goes, uh-huh. So here you go. Like <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Great <laughs> honor to be with you. The governor, Terry McAuliffe. Thank you. Thank you very much. There we go. There we go. Yeah.